But last week we started this series called Worthy. And we answered a, a crucial question last week because if we're going to worship God and if it's, we're going to do it like Jesus said to do it in spirit and in truth with that authenticity and knowing who we're worshiping and, and worshiping him with the right heart and spirit, then we had to answer the question last week, why is he worthy, right? Because if our why is big enough, we can do any what. And so that, that question of why is he worthy is so incredibly important. And so today we're going to move a step forward. And I think another, another thing that we need to understand, another thing that we need to get, is we need to understand the presence of God. We need to understand what the presence of God is like. You know, we can all relate to feeling someone's presence, if you know what I mean. And just a couple examples before you think I'm, I'm getting really weird and strange on you. But have you ever like felt somebody looking at you? Like you're sitting there and you just like feel their eyes in the back of their head. Has anybody here ever had that sensation or that feeling before? Um, I know that I have. Or here's another example. Um, if you're married, you probably know what it's like when your spouse is away on a trip or out of town. And it just doesn't feel the same in the room. Like you, you just know that they're not there next to you. And just so you know, um, this might be a little... Uh, too much information, TMI, but um, I'm one of those like, don't touch me sleepers. Like I'm, we got a king size bed and I'm not a big guy. And, and if you see my wife, you know, she's, she's little and, but we're like far apart on the bed because I'm, I'm like, don't touch me. Any, any don't touch me sleepers out there, right? I'm too hot. Don't touch me. And so, and, and so even though like we're, we're like a mile apart on this king size bed, like I can tell, I can tell when she's not there, Right. It just feels different when someone is around. But when it comes to God's presence, we get a little squirrely sometimes. And maybe you've seen someone react to God's presence and thought to yourself, if that's what God's presence looks like, count me out. Anybody ever been there? It's like, you know, somebody has got the Holy Ghost and you're like, oh, I don't know if I want that. I mean, we're just being honest. Let's be real today. And so, you know, there's a lot of preconceived notions. There's some misconceptions. There's a lot of it that we just don't understand. And so from the get-go today, I just want to make a confession. I don't get it all, and I'm still learning. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't understand what we can know about the presence of God. And so that's what we're going to do today. You know, it's kind of a sticky issue. And so we have to balance out, we have to be careful to balance out what our experiences have been with the word of God. Because if you're experiencing something and you call it God's presence and it's not biblical, then guess what? It, it was probably the Indian food you ate last night or the pizza or, or something is, is just getting to you. I'm thinking I said that because I ate Indian food last <laughs> night and it was so good. But right thinking leads to right living. And so we need to think right when it comes to the presence of God. We all have five senses, and you've probably heard this before. We have touch, we have see, we have sight, we feel things, we have taste, and we can hear things. And if you have all those five senses today, you can give God glory for a miracle, right? Because some people don't have them all. And so that's a really cool thing. God gave us these. They're gifts from him. They're definitely a part of experiencing the presence of God, but definitely not all of it, right? God sometimes shows himself in ways that we can sense, but when he doesn't, it doesn't negate the realities of who he is. You know, it's hard to understand something you can't see. And I think every person, no matter who you are, if you thought about God very much, if you thought about Jesus, you're like, man, it's kind of hard to believe in something that I can't see. And if you've asked that question, you don't have to feel bad. You don't have to feel less spiritual than maybe the person next to you because they're so confident in their faith. No, it's a really normal thing. And so it's hard to believe in something that you can't see. And, and because we don't see it, many times as humans, we reduce the presence of God to what we can sense with our five senses. But what if, and this is the question I want you to really wrestle with this morning, what if God's presence was bigger than that? What if? Think about this. The same God and the same spirit, God is spirit. And so the same spirit was there at 
the creation. Right? He was there before the world began. He was there. The same God, the same presence of God was there at the fall in the garden when Adam and Eve ate that fruit that they weren't supposed to. The same presence of God was there at the flood, Noah and the ark. The same presence of God was there at the Exodus when the Israelites were freed from Egypt. And if you don't know all these stories, hey, just bear with us. But man, they're great stories and you should just check them out. The same spirit of God was there in the exile when the Israelites were sent to Babylon. The same spirit was there at the first Christmas when Jesus was born. The same presence of God was there at the crucifixion when God actually turned away from Jesus because Jesus took our sin on himself. The same presence of God was there at the resurrection when Jesus rose from the grave. I can't wait to celebrate that in a few weeks. Isn't it going to be awesome? Mark your calendars, April 17th. It's Easter. It's coming. But the, the, the writer of the Psalms in, in, one thir- in Psalm 139.7, he said, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? And so even in the Old Testament, th- these guys had the sense that, hey, I can't get away from it. And then in Psalm 51 and 10 through 11, when David was, conf- he was, he was praying this prayer of repentance, he had messed up, he had sinned. And what did he say? He said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So we see this hunger to be in the presence of God, to be close to God. And so today, as we think about the presence of God, we got to remember that our worship must reflect the realities of the one we are worshiping. It's gotta reflect who he is. And so let's look back through history one more time. You know, he was in the garden, right? His presence was there. He was there before the law was given to Moses in the Old Testament. If you've heard of the Ten Commandments, maybe you saw, saw the, old, the old movie with Charles and Heston up on the mountain and, and getting the Ten Commandments. And, and it, it was probably something like that, but not probably completely like that, right? And, and God's presence was there. God's presence was in, in the Old Testament. And, and when you hear that, you're like, what does Old Testament mean? It means the Old Covenant or the Old Agreement that God had between Him and the Israelites. And so in that agreement, God's presence interacted with the Israelites in a very specific way. God's presence was there in the New Testament, which is the, the back half of your Bible, in my opinion, where things got really good, right? The new agreement. And so, and so just like there was an old way that God's presence interacted with the people, now there's a new way, there's a new agreement, there's a new covenant with how God's presence interacts with us. But sometimes because of our human nature, we're trying to worship God based on old covenant rules and mindsets. We do this all the time. And this is why I feel like this is such an important topic for you and me to understand today. We read this verse last week, but it says in Isaiah 29, 13, these people come near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only by rules taught by men. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that kind of worshiper. I don't want to be somebody who just does the motions that just goes through church and just checks it off the list and and just does the things I'm supposed to do that people are teaching me. I want to personally experience the presence of God because he's not a God that is far off. He's not a God that can't be known. He is a God that wants to be known by you and he knows you more than you know yourself. So he's an incredibly intimate and personal God. Let's look real quick. How has God's presence interacted with man throughout scripture? He walked with them in the garden. I don't know exactly what that looked like, but that's what it says. He walked with them in the cool of the evening. He talked to men in the Old Testament. He wrestled with Jacob. How cool. I was a wrestler, so I always thought that story was cool. How cool would that be? He was in the burning bush talking to Moses. His presence was somehow in the Ark of the Covenant that the Israelites carried around. He was in the cloud by day and the fire by night that led them through the desert. 
He was in the tent or the tabernacle that they set up and God gave very specific instructions. And hey, set this up and his presence is going to live in that holy of holies inside of the tabernacle. His presence we see was, you know, in certain places was a wind or an earthquake or lightning or fire or smoke or even a whisper. His presence was in the temple. Once, once Solomon got that temple built, God's presence resided there in the holiest of holies. His presence came through prophecy in the Old Testament, tons of prophets. And so all throughout scripture, we see these ways that his presence was made known. And then his presence came and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ in flesh and bone. His presence was seen in miracles all throughout scripture. His presence was seen in the book of Acts as a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire on the heads of each of those 120 believers in the upper room. His presence was then seen through the ministry of Paul and the other apostles through the powerful and bold preaching of God's word. His presence is all over the place. And so it's, help, it's, it's helpful to define it as much as possible. But as you can see, it's hard to define. It doesn't live out by our parameters. God's presence doesn't answer to you and to me. It's bigger than that. He lives outside of time. He lives outside of space. He's not governed by our rules. But let's try. Let's do as much as we can understand so that we can give ourselves some really good tracks to run on when it comes to understanding the presence of God because how you understand the presence of God will determine how you worship. And I've got a lot today, so forgive me, but I'll try to get you out of here before one. What is the prince's presence of God like? Let's start by answering what it's not. What it's not. And I just left some space for you to write today. And so you write down anything that hits home for you. First of all, the presence of God is not a feeling. It's not a feeling in and of itself. Now, I absolutely can feel the presence of God sometimes. But guess what? Not always. You say, Pastor, you don't always feel it when the presence of God is around? Guess what? No. Why? I'm just a dude. I'm just a guy. And so some people say, man, I really felt the presence of God at that church. I love it. I love it when people say that, like, that church is really anointed as if God's not anointing other churches that lift up the name of Jesus. It doesn't really make sense. Can you imagine reducing the presence of the almighty God to your feelings? Five minutes later, you want pizza. <laughs> it's not a feeling. It's not. Not only a feeling. You can feel it, but it's not, it's not the definition. What about this? The presence of God is not just music. It's not just music. As a matter of fact, get this. Neither Jews nor Christians formalized their music until six or seven hundred years after Christ ascended. It's not music. And yet... In our current structure these days, and I love music. I've been a worship leader almost all my ministry life. Um, I, my parents forced me to sing as a kid at church, and, and to, I'm thankful to them now. But back then, I was like, oh, my goodness, I don't want to get up in front of people, right? But I love music. It's awesome. And, and I definitely experience God's presence uh, through music, but it's not music. The presence of God is not tied to a place. And man, this is something that we especially have to get deep in our hearts, right? It's not just in the garden of Eden. It's not just in the burning bush, or the, cloud of, the cloud by day and the fire by the night. The monuments in the Old Testament, the, the, the Israelites, they would build monuments to places where God met them and did something special and they'd put up rocks and, and it'd be like, man, God met us there. But God's presence isn't only there. God's presence didn't stay in the Ark of the Covenant or the tabernacle or the temple or the Holy of Holies. God's presence doesn't stay at church when you leave and go to work. It doesn't stay at, at camp. If you go to youth camp, it doesn't stay at that conference where you really felt him. It doesn't stay in that special service or that, that worship time. It doesn't stay in your prayer closet at home. It's not, tied to, not just tied to a place. It's not just tied to a style. 
It's not tied to, you know, when you wear the special clothes or the priestly garments or the robes or when you sing certain songs. Like some people literally think that the presence of God only resides in a few certain hymns, right? God's not bound by that. It's not bound as to by certain rituals or, or ways of doing things or certain traditions. God's presence isn't just tied to, certain, to a certain physical posture. You know, I've heard people before say, oh, I always worship God like this, or I have to bow down, or I have to dance, or I have to clap, or I have to raise my hands, or I have to get face down prostrate before God, or I have to run, you know, and, and who, you know, no, you don't only experience God's presence like that. You know what all these things reflect? When we tied God down to just certain little things, and we're like, man, that's the way to experience the presence of God. You know, you know what that reflects? It reflects Old Testament worship, the old way, where things had to be a certain way for God's presence to, to be there. Now, don't get me wrong. God's presence can be experienced in these ways. History proves it. We just went through all these things in the Bible, right? And guess what? You can feel God's presence. And guess what? During a song today, you might have experienced God's presence. But don't take the method through which you experience God's presence as the only way. He's not trapped there. And I just want to encourage you this morning that there's more. And these ways definitely aren't the only way. Guess what? There's a higher way. There's an even better way to think about it and to view it. So what it is, what is it? Let's write some things down. It's omnipresent, which means it's everywhere at the same time, always. Like, like the psalmist said, where can I go? Where can I go to get away from his presence? So God's presence is everywhere. It's available. And we're going to unpack that in depth here in a minute. It's purposeful. God's presence never just shows up so you can feel good. God's presence always shows up to lead you somewhere. And that's a huge thing. We don't come to church just for our conscience to get appeased or to feel better or just to get our guilt and shame lifted. No, we come to church because God is taking us somewhere and he's leading us towards something and he's got purposes and plan for your life that are good. God's presence brings healing, right? Man, when we're in the presence of God, we experience healing. Not always physical, sometimes, but he can heal your heart. He can heal your mind. God's presence is unbound. Whatever box you try to put it in, he'll probably blow up the box. He probably will because he's bigger than anything your mind and heart can ever comprehend. And so what is it now for us? Now it's, it's, it's really the picture of New Testament worship, which we're going to unpack. So what does that look like? We're going to fly through some scripture verses. All are, uh, most, at least, of the texts are in your notes, but because of space on your page, they're not all there. They'll all be on the screen, and so follow along with me. In Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. So the writer of Hebrews is basically saying, it used to be like this, but now it's like this. And that new way is through the person and the presence of Jesus Christ. Right? And so that's a huge thing to understand that it used to be one way, but now it's different. Let's continue. And then Jesus comes. Jesus comes on the scene. And Jesus said this to his disciples in John 14, 15 through 17. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Underline that. He'll never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now. Jesus was telling them, hey, I'm here with you now. And later he will be in you. It's building. So in the past, prophets, various ways. Now, Jesus. And now Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to send you another one. The Holy Spirit is going to be inside. It's going to be in you. And so Jesus says this. And then a little bit later, Jesus dies on the cross. He goes to the cross to pay for the sin of all humanity. 
And so while he is on the cross, he breathes his last breath. And when he did this, this is what happened. In Matthew 27, 50, it says, Then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple, remember in the Old Testament, where, the, where God's presence resided, there were two sections. There was the holy place and then the holy of holies. And there was this curtain that separated God's presence from the people. And only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies just once a year to, to give atonement for the sin of all the people. And so I know that's a lot to take in, but that's, that was the model. And so at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Newsflash, no human hands tore that curtain. And so at the moment that Jesus paid for your sin and mine, the presence of God became accessible and available to every person on the planet. It's a miracle. And so here's what Jesus' death and that tearing of the curtain means for that old way of doing things, the way that we used to view the presence of God, the way that we've used to worship God. Here's what it means for us today. In Hebrews 10.1, it says that the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. So the old way is not the way we're doing it now. They were just a picture of the good things that Jesus was going to bring. And so then in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, it says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us, I mean, you got to underline this part, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts and fully trusting him. For our guilty consciousness has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. This is the gospel, folks. And you might, you might not have thought about all this, but man, there was an old way and there, now there's a new way. And I don't want you to get trapped in a thinking about God's presence that is obsolete anymore. There's a better way. You can go right in to God's presence. And so here's the outcome of a spirit-filled life with constant access to the presence of God. Because you've got to ask yourself, what does this mean for my life? If I have constant access to God's presence, if because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he made such a sacrifice, what does that mean for me now? In Romans 8, 11, it tells you, it says, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of, the, of sin, the spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. You, let that sink in, church. The same spirit that caused Jesus to resurrect, to come up out of that grave, for that stone to be rolled away, that kind of power lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living in you. So where is the presence of God? It's in you. It's in you when you've surrendered your life to Christ. Amen. And so Jesus dies. Three days later, he rose again. He hung out with his disciples, appeared to them over the course of 40 days. He ascended to heaven. And then in Acts, in Acts 1.8, right before he goes up to heaven, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Man, the presence of God is bigger than most of us give it credit for. It's not just a church service. It's not just a style. It's not just this or that. No, it's purpose. It's power. It's for you. And so a few things before we wrap up today. Number one, God's presence went from the outside to the inside. It went from the outside to the inside. 
Romans 8, 11, it said, and Christ lives within you. Man, it's cool to be at the game, right? To be at it where everybody's going crazy. It's cool to be in here today. And you just feel the, the, the uh, electricity in the room because everybody's excited and people are getting baptized. But how many of you want to know? It's one thing to be watching it from the outside. It's another thing to be in the tank, experiencing it. And if you've been baptized, you know what I mean. It's one thing to be at the game. Man, one time when I was a teenager, my parents, um, I was the youngest of four, which you means, which you know, it kind of means that my parents kind of let me do whatever I wanted, right? Can I get an amen? All those baby, baby children out there. And so um, I, I got to fly up to Minneapolis one time with my buddy to go to a Bulls game. I was like 15 years old. That's how we did it back then, right? And so I fly up to Minneapolis. I go to a, a, a Bulls game at, where the Timber, against the Timberwolves there because my buddy was uh, at, at college up there. And so we met. And MJ was like the man to me when I was a teenager. I had posters in our room. And so I get to go to the game. And guess what? It was everything that I ever imagined. Really cool story. He, he was having a lights out game. And then after halftime, he doesn't come out on the floor. And we're like... I came all this way to see Michael Jordan, and now he's out of the game. He's not even on the bench. Where did he go? Come to find out later, somebody prank called this prank called and said that his mom was like sick and dying, and so he was trying to verify this. Turns out his mom was totally fine, and so then he comes out in the fourth quarter and scores like 15 points in the fourth quarter and just goes all crazy on the Timberwolves. It was awesome. It was one thing to be at the game. How many of you know that it's a whole other thing to be on, down on the court, experiencing it, to be there? Man, when I was growing up, I went to Cardinals games, and Ozzie Smith, he was my man. I'm a Cardinals fan. Sorry, Reds. And so I got to see him do the backflip. I was at the game, and Ozzie, who wasn't even a power hitter, hit the last home run of his career. And he hit it switch hitting, and which was, that, it was super cool. It was cool to be there. But I'm sure it's way cooler for Ozzie on the field. Last year, I was... I was at the Reds Stadium with Kip. <laughs> Kip took me to opening day, and guess who won? The Cardinals. <laughs> it was so great. Like, first inning or second inning, uh, one of our guys cracked a home run, and I just look over at Kip, and he's just shaking his head. Here we go again. It was great to be at the game, but it's nothing like being on the field. It's another thing for you to experience the presence of God. And this is what the presence of God does. It goes from outside to in. It's not just watching from afar. It's not just, just being a part of the church service. It's saying, hey, I'm going to enter in. I'm going to welcome the Holy Spirit, not just into the room, into my heart. What's it say in Revelation? That Jesus, it's like he's standing at the door of our hearts and he's knocking and he just wants us to let him in. Right? Let him in. I don't want to watch from a distance. I want everything God has for me. And so an adjustment in your attitude and your view of the presence of God is that he's gone. He wants to go from the outside to the inside. It's time to open your heart and say, God, I want to experience you. I want everything that you have for me to come close, to rearrange, go all extreme makeover edition in my life. Right. Let him in. The second thing about God's presence is that it went from being available to some. You know, God, God worked in various times through prophets and, and he, God's presence was obviously on certain people in the Old Testament. You know, so went from being available to some and the high priests, you know, they got to experience it. But then it went to all. In Hebrews 10, it says, let us go right into the presence of God. Not just the priests, us. He includes all of us. Let's go. In Acts 2, 4, there was tongues of fire on each head. Not just Peter's, not just John, not just those closest to Jesus, all of them. Not just the priests, not just the pastors, not just the leaders, not just those who never miss church. It's available to all. Number three, God's presence went from showing up sometimes to never going away. And I think this is the biggest gift. Amazing. John 14 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Have you embraced that? 
That God's presence is available to you forever. It doesn't end when you leave the building. It doesn't stop when the music stops. He can go with you to your work. He can be at the golf course with you. He can be everywhere that you go. Right? The reality of God's presence is bigger than our perception or it's bigger than our perception of it or our ability to perceive it. And so don't try to put him in a box. A couple more things. What can keep me from God's presence? Because it's very clear in scripture that there's, there's, there's just a couple things that can keep you from God's presence. And the first is unresolved sin. Sin is the great separator between you and the presence of God. The problem of sin has not changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament, right? How God's presence interacts with humanity is different, but the problem that separates the two is the same. We still have a sin problem from the Garden of Eden to the church house. It's the same. The solution has changed. No more temple sacrifices, no more tabernacle or anything like that. No, it's available to everybody. But unresolved sin separates you from God's presence. Another thing that can keep you from God's presence is unresolved relationships. A a, a theme in, in the New Testament church was unity. You know, we can't be okay with God, but be in conflict with the body or, or other people. It just doesn't work. In 1 Peter 3, 7, it's talking about husband and wife relationships. And it says to the husband, treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Whoa. I better be good to my wife. I want God to hear my prayers. I want him to, to experience his presence. I want to experience his presence. Another place in Matthew 5, 23, Jesus says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar, remember he's relating to these people in the way that they knew to experience God's presence. If you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. In other parts of the New Testament, it says forgive, just as Christ forgave you. And so just a couple things. God, do I have any unresolved sin in my life that I need to confess? That I need to repent and turn around and go the other direction? Man, the Bible says that when you confess your sins, that times of healing and refreshing are gonna come, right? And when you say, I'm sorry, now you can't change somebody's reaction, so. You can reconcile your start of the relationship. That doesn't change, you know, what other people do. And so it might take them some time, but you've got to let them go. You've got to forgive. You've got to, you've got to reconcile on your side and say either I forgive you or please forgive me. And once you've done your part, you come to God and say, God, here I am. I've forgiven them just like you forgave me. I don't want anything to get in between my relationship with you and me. Amen. What are the benefits of God's presence in my life? Power for witness. God's created for you for a purpose. He wants you to tell somebody what he's done in your life. What about power over sin? You don't have to stay a slave to all the junk that, you, that, that was running you before you met Jesus. And if you haven't met Jesus, you can find freedom in him. Peace. God's presence bring you, brings you peace that passes your understanding. God's presence brings you comfort. That's what he is. He's the great comforter. God's presence brings you direction and boldness and purpose. God's presence can even bring miracles in your life. Lots of kinds of miracles. So what do I do? This is where we close today. What do I do? You got to open the door of our hearts. We got to let Jesus in. We got to say, God, I understand that your presence is there. I couldn't even come to you, God, without your Holy Spirit drawing me and leading me. I couldn't even come to you if your presence wasn't there. And so, God, your presence is here. God, come into my life. I invite you. And then, God, you have full reign in my life. I love that verse that says, let the Holy Spirit lead in every part of your life. Don't compartmentalize him just to church time or You know, let him go to work with you. Let him 
be in your relationship with your spouse. Let him dictate and direct how you parent. Start listening to the Holy Spirit's voice in your life, in the presence of God. He wants to lead you way more than he cares that you feel him. He cares way more about your character than your comfort. And so don't reduce him to just a few things. Let him lead you in every area of your life. What else? We pray, God, help me to listen and obey. Help me to be sensitive to your presence. That's why I love this song. You know, and we're going to sing it again in here in a second. God, I want to be aware of your presence. It's because sometimes I might not feel it, but it's there. And I just need to be more aware. I need to be more sensitive to the presence of God. What else do I do? No more boxes. No more putting in a God in a box and saying you can't do this or can't do that. No, just faith. God, have your way in my life. God, I'm not closing off any part of my life to you. I want everything you have for me. So God, here I am. Just that openness to say, God, I want everything that you have for me. Man, I really believe, church, that when you kind of shift perspective and in your prayer time at home or when you're driving in the car or when you're walking down the trail and you're just talking to Jesus and you say, God, I want to be aware of your presence. When you're intentional with opening the boundaries of God's presence in your life to include so many more areas and and not putting them in a box, and you really own these truths in your life, you're going to begin to see him and experience him in ways that you didn't before. And better than that, he's going to begin to lead you and guide you and, and lead you to be more like Christ, which that's the goal, right? The goal isn't to, to feel it, but sometimes you do. Thank you, Jesus. The goal is to be more like Jesus. And so if you could bow your heads and close your eyes with me today, if you're here and you'd like to give your life to Christ, you watch those people get baptized, you heard that Jesus died on the cross for you, that he rose again from the grave, and you say, Joe, this is my day. I want to put my faith and trust in a God that loves me that much. If that's you today, and you feel like God's been leading you to this moment, and it's time for you to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if that's you, raise your hand today. I'd love to pray with you. Amen. Anybody else? I'll give you just a moment. Maybe God's really working on your heart, working on your life right now. It's time to surrender your life to Christ. Is that you today? Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. God, I pray for those that raise their hand today. God, I pray for those online that have made a decision to follow you today. God, I pray that you just meet them right there where they're at. And if you raised your hand today, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer in your own words. And basically what you need to do, you need to admit that you need a Savior, that you're a sinner. Confess that you're not right with God. And then invite Jesus to be your Lord, to be your Savior. Accept his free gift of salvation. Trust and believe that he died on the cross for you, that he rose again on the third day. And then commit that you're going to follow Jesus the rest of your life. Amen. You can do that right now in your own words. And as you accept Christ today, the Bible says that you become a new creation in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen. Amen. And based on God's word that we read today, Christ now lives in you. Isn't that amazing? Let's give them a hand today. Amen. Stand with me, church. Uh, we're going to sing just a little bit, just together. And if you're here today and you just say, Joe, I want to be more aware of God's presence. If that's you, just raise your hand. God, I thank you for your church. I thank you for those that want to be more aware, that want to just blow up the box that maybe we put you in with our own perceptions, with our own ideas. God, help us to understand that you want to be with us all the time, that your presence isn't bound by the confines of our understanding. God, help us to see you for who you really are, unbound, unchained, ready to work in our lives. You're available. God, you want to lead us and guide us. God, help us. In Jesus' name. Thanks for joining.
joining us online at Mosaic Church. We hope today's message was life-changing and useful. For more info, visit mosaiccincinnati.com.